Church at Centro this morning. We're going to stand and lift our praises to the Lord this morning. I just encourage you to really, you know, give all that you got as we worship this morning and just allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you as well.
be all in, in our own way. Just thank Him. Thank Him and praise Him. Thank Him for what He's done. Thank Him for who He is. Just give us space for all of us to do that right now, just all together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. in it. Thank you that we could come together as brothers and sisters in you, praising your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have. And we will continue to praise you, God, and worship you because you are worthy. You are worthy of all praise. And the 
dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church, and the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old shall not leave seated. We're just going to take a few minutes to share around the communion table. As communion says, it's a common union of us and Jesus together. So, you know, as we partake of this, we did this here every week, but it's not to be a ritual. It's not just to do something for the sake of doing it. I think it's a great time we can just reflect. You know, the Bible talks about when we take communion to remember Him, what He's done for us. And so often we just get in our own little world and we forget about what He has done for us. So I think it's good to pause to remember the principle established throughout Scripture. You know, Abram, when he was given promises by God, what did he do? He built an altar. It was a place of remembrance. So as we're sharing communion today, just in your heart, just thank God for what he's done for you, where he's taking you, what he's showing you in your life, how he's leading you. I just want to share from the Old Testament, and it's actually the Passover. And I won't read it all, but I'll just maybe try to condense it as to this account. So here the the Israelites were in Egypt and they're in slavery. And there's been nine plagues that went before, but there's this 10th plague that was going to happen. And it was to do with the, the death of the firstborn. But God spoke to Moses and Aaron and and told them what to do. And they spoke to the congregation of Israel. And this is what they were to do. On the 10th day of the month, they were to take a lamb without blemish. And on the 14th day, they were to sacrifice that lamb for their household. They were to get a hyssop plant. They were to dip it in the blood and they would put it over their doorposts of their house as a sign and they were to stay inside. And at midnight, the angel death moved over and seen the blood over the doorposts. So there we can see, because of the sacrifice, 
There was protection. I wonder if it was their obedience. I wonder what God's saying to us today. You know, it's just a great time to to look, you know, there's so many things that communion might mean to someone, you know. The Bible talks about taking up our cross daily. It talks about a lot of things. To remember him, what he has done. But, you know, that was an Old Testament sacrifice. Jesus came as the ultimate sacrifice. He came to fulfill the law. No more animal sacrifices. He was the ultimate sacrifice. So I just want to share one last scripture. And this is in Hebrews, it says this. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with those same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have cause to be offered? For the worships as once purified would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And then it goes on and says this. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book that is written of me to do your will, O God. Hallelujah. Thank you for Jesus and the obedience, the sacrifice. Thank you. So as we just have these emblems, just reflect on them for a minute. You know, the bread represents his body broken for you and me. And we can just look at it, think, oh yeah, it's just a biscuit or a wafer or whatever. Or we can look at it and say, this is Jesus' body that was broken for us. The holes, maybe, I don't know, the piercing, the weight of sin that he took upon himself and then we've got the blood the word says that it's in our new covenant it's a new covenant with Jesus as we just pray let's just Thank God for what he's done in your life. Just reflect and Lord, we just thank you for the emblems today. As we partake, Lord, we don't do it flippantly. Father, we just want to take time to acknowledge you. Thank you for your goodness, your redemption, your sacrifice. We just thank you, Lord. Let's just eat and drink together. Thank you. Hallelujah.
relationship with you, God. Thank you for making a way. We honor you today, Jesus. Give you honor if you glory today, God. Once you finish praying, you can stand up and sing along with us as we continue to worship him in the next song. Take your time if you still need time.
we really do exalt you, Lord. We lift you high. We honour you. We worship you in this place. Lord, I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for your will to be done in this place and in our lives and in our hearts. Thank you, worship team. You guys can grab a seat. Actually, don't grab a seat. Or grab a seat, or grab a seat, or don't grab a seat. Your call. <laughs> I just wanted to play yo-yo. We haven't done that in a while. Welcome to church, everyone. Welcome online. Uh, just before we have Pastor David share the word, thought we might go and saddle up beside someone and find out something new about someone that you might not know. Who knows, they might have a hidden talent that you need or you might have a hidden talent that they need. Anyway, say hi, you've got two minutes. That's 120 seconds. Now, there's, a, there's a, a scripture in the Bible says in Revelation, there was silence in heaven for space of half an hour. So we're going to practice that this morning. <laughs> and then once I've finished, you can all start again. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, it's uh, good to be here. Margaret, my wife and I are so happy to be here with you again this morning. Thank you for Melinda for your warm welcome to us. It's lovely to be here. Now, um, with Mark and Cindy not being here this morning, um, I can say what I like, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, that won't happen. Um, it's just a joy to be here with you again and just to see you all again. Isn't it great to be in the house of God? It really is. We have so much to thank for. When we're contemplating while we're having communion there, what Jesus has done uh, for us, we wouldn't be here this morning. You wouldn't be sitting here this morning if Jesus hadn't have fulfilled all that he did there at the cross of Calvary. 
And I'm, I'm glad to see that the, the cross is still there to, to remind us. You know, quite often when Easter comes and Easter goes and you think, oh, well, that's Easter for another year, you know. So what are we going to talk about now? No, well, look, Easter, the, uh, the situ- what happened at Easter was just the start. It wasn't the, it wasn't the end of anything. It was the start. And uh, so we'll find that out as we come to the Word of God. So let's just pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for your Word this morning. We thank you for this time of fellowship that we can enjoy together here in your house. And we pray by your Holy Spirit you'll enable us, Lord, to open your Word and to find wondrous truth concerning yourself so that your name will be glorified and that your people will be blessed and inspired by all that you are and all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody cried out, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Easter, Good Friday. What a day that was. And uh, so I'd like to speak about the motivations behind the situation that happened at that Passover time in uh, Jerusalem on that fateful day. And uh, when we come together at Easter time, we, we concentrate on what Jesus actually did at that time. And as Gavin was leading us in communion there this morning, when uh, the blood was pasted on the lintels of the door, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. But the blood of lambs was only a, 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 a pro tem for the time being until the perfect sacrifice could come along. And that perfect sacrifice was Jesus. And uh, it says in the scripture that when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed and it dripped into the dirt, remember he made the dirt, the dirt was his creation. And when the blood dripped down into the dirt of his creation, it cried out to God. And what did it cry out? Well, the Bible tells us that it cried out something, what? It cried out redemption. It cried out mercy and grace. And it cried out reconciliation with God. And the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus spoke better things than that of Abel. When Abel was slain by his brother, God said to, to, to Cain, he said, I know what's happened because his blood is crying out to me from the ground. You see, God says the life is in the blood and the blood talks to God. God's very clever. He can talk to blood. He can talk to the dirt. He can talk to the mountains. In Ezekiel 38, 36, 37, we read where God says to the mountains of Israel, get yourselves ready because my people are coming back. God can talk to anything and anybody. And so likewise, God can have a conversation with the blood. And the blood of Jesus spoke better things than that of Abel. It didn't cry out murder. It didn't cry out rebellion and sin. It cried out redemption, reconciliation, the grace of God. Isn't that wonderful? And because of that, we are here today rejoicing and at peace in the house of God. So it was great to have that time of communion together this morning. But what were the motivations? What were the the factors behind the cross of Calvary that drove Jesus to that point where he gave himself on the cross? I'd like to read from Matthew 26, from verse 36 on, just for a few verses. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them to the place called Gethsemane. And he said unto his disciples, You sit here for a while while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him three men, three of his disciples, Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. The weight of your sin and my sin was coming on him. This was the moment. This was his moment that he'd he'd come here for. And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he said to them, look, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. And he went a little further. 
And he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And here we see the determination of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to do what? To pursue his Father's will. He went a little further. The three disciples could come with him a little further than the, than the rest of them, but there came a time when they couldn't go any further. He had to go to a place where they could never go, and that place was going to be the cross where he would shed his blood. He went a little further, and he said, let this cup pass from me. What was the motivation here for Jesus at this time? I believe it was the love that existed between Jesus and his Father. No doubt about that. In 1 John 4, 7 to 10, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. That's where it comes from. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loveth and knoweth not, loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. That's what God is. It's his nature. It's his attribute. In this was made known the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in this love, here it is, here's the example. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, what's that? It's a big word. It means the appeasement, to appease the, the holiness of God. A sacrifice had to be made to satisfy the holiness of God. And the only thing that could do that was a perfect, sinless, pure sacrifice. And that was the blood of Jesus Christ himself. And it was because of the love that Jesus had for his father and the love that the father had for the son. We can't fully understand the strength of what that love is. But there was a force there between the two of them that meant that Jesus was determined to do what his father needed to be done. There was a need that had to be met. It was all part of the plan and purpose of God, as we will find out as we go on. And the only way it could be done was for Jesus to do what he was going to have to do. But why did he do it? He did it because he loved his father, because he knew that his father loved him. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In 2019, Margaret and I were privileged to go to Israel. My elder son, Anthony, who went to be with the Lord two years ago, very quickly, and uh, he was pastoring a, a church in Minneapolis in Minnesota of about 2,000, and um, he's doing a great work there for the Lord, and he organised this trip to Israel, and he said, Dad, you've got to get there. You've just got to be there. So that's it. That's the instruction. So we were. And uh, one of the things that we did, we went to, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, I've got a lovely photo uh, in my album at home of my son and myself in the Garden of Gethsemane, just arm in arm together, father and son. And I thought to myself at that moment when we were in the garden there together, I thought, now, now I love my son. Now, all of you parents, you, you know how much you love your children. And you know what you'd do anything for your children? And, and the, that's at that irrepressible force of love. And, 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 and I thought to myself, I love my son, but I could never ask him to do what Jesus did for me. I, could, I, I couldn't do that. But, but Jesus was prepared to, to, to do that, to separate himself from his father at that time because he knew that when he took upon himself your sin and my sin, that his father, because of the holiness of God, his father was going to have to turn his back on him. 
Now, I mean, that's... For a, for a father to turn his back on his son, I could never do that to my boy. But the father, the father did it, not because he hated his son, but because he loved you and he loved me. The love of God, this irrepressible force, this love of God, that's what was motivating Jesus there at the cross. And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done and Jesus at that moment said father I'm prepared to go on it and his father had to turn his back on him because of the holiness of God the holiness of God is is something about God that is not able to be broached in any way or, the, or intruded upon in any way at all God is holy and God said be ye holy for I am holy and when God <coughs> brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, uh, subsequent to the Passover, and Pharaoh said, for goodness sake, go. And, uh, and they went. And uh, God said to Moses, now what I want you to do is bring the people to this mount where I'm talking to you when he gave them the instructions there. And uh, he said, bring them to it back to me. And when you get them here, I'm going to get you to come up onto the mountain and, and I'm going to tell you what the deal is from now on. And uh, when they got there, God said to Moses, now set bounds around the mountain because nobody is to come onto the mountain except you, not even an animal, because if they do, they'll die. Why? Because of the holiness of God. God is never prepared to allow his holiness to be broached. It's an unassailable quality of God that cannot be touched or tainted, the holiness of God. And because of sin, it was what separated you and me from God. Because of what Adam did back there in the Garden of Eden, we were separated from God and sin was the problem. And the holiness of God said, no, you can't. And so when Jesus said to his father, I'm now going to take upon myself the sin of the whole world. The Father, because of his holiness, had to turn his back on him. What a moment. Never happened in eternity. Never. Never. You imagine the, 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 the horrible feeling in the heart of Jesus when he knew his Father had turned his back on him. And he was on his own. He was on his own. And he was on his own for you and he was on his own for me so that we would never be on our own ever again. Isn't that wonderful? And, and we ought to thank the Lord for it every day. And every time we have communion, that's the idea of it, that we should remember what Jesus has done for us. It was the love of God. In Psalm 91, Psalm 91 is a wonderful psalm in the Old Testament. It's a prophetic psalm. And I, I, I think I may have mentioned it here once before. It's, uh, it's quite a unique psalm because when you look at the grammar of it, you find that it's written in three tenses and it's written in three persons. It's the minutes of the agenda of a conversation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit way back in eternity. And uh, it, it is a conversation about what is, needs to be done and what's going to happen. And it starts off, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, present tense, shall abide, future tense, under the shadow of the Almighty, he. Now there was only one who ever dwelt in the secret place of the Most High because of the holiness of God, and that was Jesus. And where is he now? He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and uh, he's back there because he completed the work that he had to do. But he had to go and do the job. And through the body of Psalm 91, we find the Holy Spirit there comes into the conversation and begins to spell out to Jesus what the job was going to do. With your eyes, you'll, only with your eyes shall you see the reward of the wicked. It will not come nigh you. Ten thousand shall fall at your right hand, etc. But it will not come nigh you. Only with your eyes shall you see it. And that happened. 
when Jesus went down and preached deliverance to the captives, those who were in Abraham's bosom, waiting for the perfect sacrifice there, as Jesus told us the story about Lazarus and the rich man, Abraham's bosom. Jesus went down and preached deliverance to those captives once he had shed his blood and the sacrifice was made. He was able then, he had permission from his father to go down and preach deliverance to the captives and he saw with his eyes the reward of the wicked but it did not come nigh him. There was no corruption came on him, hallelujah, because of the grace of God. And God says in verse 14, the father says, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore I will set him, I will exalt him, I will set him on high. And the father's love for his son said, because he has done this great work of redemption at the cross of Calvary, I'll restore him to where he was with me forever and eternity. And on the third day, Jesus rose again from the dead. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And because of that, we're sitting here in the house of God today. And that's the reality of it, because of the love of God. God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But also, there was necessity for something else, for grace and for truth. For grace had been in short supply. The Bible tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but grace was a commodity that was in very short supply in the Old Testament. And um, when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he gave instructions to Moses, and you can read all about it in the book of Leviticus, the, the sacrifices that had to be made to cover for the sins of the people. And I'll tell you what, some of them are pretty horrendous. But, a, but the thing that stands out about it is there was no grace there. It was just black and white. You do the sin, you pay the consequences. You do the crime, you do the time. And that was it. There was no grace there because of the holiness of God. But there needed to be an infusion of grace into the situation. John, first, John chapter 1 in John's Gospel, verses 14 and 17, John says this, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Here's Jesus, and he comes and he brings grace and he brings truth. Verse 17 says, For the law was given, brought by Moses, but grace and truth, they came by Jesus Christ. Poor old Moses, he couldn't bring any grace at all. All he could do was unfold to them the law that God had given to him. But when Jesus came, he said, I've got something else to give you. I've brought some grace into the situation, the grace of God that was so necessary. This, this quality of God, this graciousness of God, that God wanted to show that not only was he holy, a holy God, but he was a gracious God. He's not a God who just wants to kill everybody and get revenge and, and do us all in. No, God is a God of grace. And, uh, and it says of Jesus when he was ministering, and they wondered at the gracious words that proceeded from his lips, full of grace and full of truth, Jesus was. In 1, Colossians, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, Paul tells us, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you, how? By Jesus Christ. He was the instigator of grace. He was the one who brought it. Grace was on his lips. And it was the grace of God that sent him to the cross of Calvary. It was the grace of God that was a determining factor that led him into that garden of Gethsemane to that point where it was possible for him to say, no, I don't want to do it. He, he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I mean, this is Jesus talking to his father. 
This is how serious it was. But then he said that wonderful word, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Such was the grace of God exemplified in Jesus. Romans 5 and 15, Paul reminds us as he was talking to the Roman church, but not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if the, through the offence of one many be dead, good old Adam, thank you, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And so Jesus came to fulfil and to replace that which had been missing ever since Adam lost the plot in the Garden of Eden. And we will find that true as we go on talking about not only grace but talking about truth as well. For grace came into this world by one person only and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was an uh, an an example, an exampling of the grace of God when Jesus went to the cross for you and for me. But not only grace of God, but truth. Truth, oh dear me. What's happened to truth today? What's happened to truth in the world? Truth is, is, a, is an absent quality in the world today. It's your truth or my truth. There's no the truth. It's, uh, your truth is different to mine. And if you don't like my truth, well, tough luck. You're, you're out and I'm in. And that's the way it is. But there needed to be an infusion of truth into the world. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Truth. Jesus came to bring the truth. And uh, he was a, 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 pron a pronunciation of truth to the, this world. He, he announced truth. John 17, 17, Jesus said when he was praying to his father, he said, sanctify them or make them holy through your truth for your word is truth. God's word is true. If you want to know what the real truth is today, you find it in the Word of God. Here it is here. That whole book full of it. All right? Now get yourself a Bible and read the truth of the Word of God. For Jesus came to give us the truth, and he was the truth. Truth was something that went out the door in the Garden of Eden. Adam was told by God, I don't want you to eat of that particular fruit layer of that tree, because in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Now, he didn't die naturally straight away. He died naturally 30, 930 years later. But spiritually, he died immediately. What was that? He lost that ability to have a relationship with God. It was gone. He threw it away. Truth. What was the problem? He rather believed what the serpent said to him than what God said to him. Uh, who's, who's telling the truth here? And the, and the serpent says, hath God said, questioned it? And yeah, yeah, I, I'll go along with you. Uh, what God told me was a lie. And truth went out the window. But when Jesus came, the, re the responsibility that Jesus had was to go to where Adam lost the plot and to pick up the, the plot and to run with it again. And Jesus did that. You remember when Jesus came and John the Baptist saw him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus came and was baptised in water there to fulfil all righteousness because Jesus had to fulfil the law. He came under the law and he had to fulfil all the requirements of the law and he did it. He was baptised. And when he was baptised, the Holy Spirit came on him. And then the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We've got the Godhead here on the job. God is about to move in the affairs of men. And it's time for Jesus to begin his earthly ministry. For 30 years he'd walked the dusty streets of Jerusalem. And now it was the time. 
My time has now come. And it was time for Jesus to begin to do his ministerial work, which for three years would continue there until the moment when he was crucified on that cross of Calvary. He came to bring the truth. What was the first thing he did? The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. What was that for? It was in the wilderness where Adam lost the plot. And Jesus went into the wilderness amongst the wild beasts and the thorns and, and, and all of that to pick up the plot where Adam had lost it and to begin to run with it again. The plan and purpose that God had for the human race was gone and done and dusted in the earth until Jesus came along and picked it up and said, I'm going to run with it again and I'm going to make my Father's will and purpose come to pass. And he did it. And the scripture says that he set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem. You know what a flint is? It's the hardest stone and you, and it, you can't change it. And Jesus set his face as a flint. He was determined to go to the cross. What, what a thing to be determined to do, for goodness sake. But he was determined to go to the cross to fulfill his Father's will, to bring the truth. When he was there in Pilate's hall, and uh, Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, well, you, you said it. You could have no power against me unless it was given you above, from above. And that's the truth of the matter. And Pilate said, what is truth? What is truth? And this was, this was Satan's last effort to throw into the face of Jesus the fact that truth was now in the dirt. And Jesus said, I'll show you what the truth is. The truth is in the word of God. And the word became flesh. The word of God is true but the word of God isn't just something that he said. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And everything that was needed by the human race, everything that was needed by you and me was there in Jesus. When Jesus came and inserted himself into human affairs there in the Middle East, and went to that cross of Calvary for you and for me. Grace and truth were so necessary. Let me read on to you from Matthew 27. Well-known passage, but it bears reading because it's so important. Sometimes we read these scriptures at we read scriptures at Christmas time about the birth of Jesus and then we forget about it for the rest of the year. Well, this is a scripture that we often read at Easter time. Then we forget about it for the rest of the year. Well, not so, folks. We're not forgetting about this morning. Matthew 27, verse 33. When they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. And they crucified him. And they parted his garments, casting lots for them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And they set up over his head this accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right, the other on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, you that destroy the temple and build it again in three days, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And likewise also the chief priests, the rulers of Israel, they mocked him with the scribes and the elders saying, he saved others, <laughs> himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and then we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. 
The thieves also, which were crucified with him, they cast the same thing into his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, that's 12 noon, there was darkness over all the land until three o'clock. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Such was the reality of what Jesus was doing on the cross that he understood that he was separated from his father for the first time ever. You imagine the the pain in the heart of Jesus because of the love that he had from his father, being separated from his father. And they said, oh, he's calling for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, let him be. Let us see whether Elias will come and save him. And Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. In John 19, 30, John tells us that when he did that, he cried out, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. What was finished? The work that his father gave him to do because of the love that he had for his father. He finished the work that was given him to do. Such was the love that Jesus had for you and for me. And what flowed from that flows down to us here today flows from Calvary's mountain, that stream of cleansing blood that cleanses us from all our sin and makes us righteous in the sight of God is coming to us today. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Years ago, um, I used to do a bit of singing in a choirs and things and I also used to sing duets with uh, a pastor and um, his daughter now is the the wife of Pastor Brad Otto from our church Kim Kim Otto she was Kim Dobby and her father and I we used to go around preaching this is 50 years ago we're talking about now not yesterday and one of the things we used to sing was a beautiful old hymn called It Is Well I don't know whether you're familiar with it when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. And one of the verses says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. And we should praise the Lord all the time for the fact that he has cleansed us from our sin. Blessed be his name. But there's purpose in what God did. And what happened at the cross of Calvary just didn't finish there. That's the end of the story. No, it goes on. It was the beginning. It was the beginning. It says in that same verse where he cried, it is finished. And he yielded up the ghost and says, and the veil of the temple was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. Now the veil in the temple was that uh, curtain which kept unholy men out of the presence of God because of the holiness of God. It was about four or five inches thick. It was about 30 or 40 feet tall. Nobody could rip it. No man could rip it. But God ripped it from the top to the bottom. It was something that God did. Why? Because once Jesus shed his blood on the cross, a way was made open into the presence of God that anybody could go in. Hallelujah. Anybody. And by the grace of God, within the veil I now would come into the holy place to look upon thy face. I see such beauty there. None other can compare. I worship thee, my Lord, within the veil. All because of what Jesus did. The purpose goes on. God has a great purpose. First Peter uh, 18 to 20, 
Paul says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, hallelujah, as of a lamb slain without blemish and without spot, who truly was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Jesus was foreordained. It was part of the plan and purpose of God that Jesus did it. And if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, you'll see there that Paul tells us that as members of the church, the body of Christ, God the Father saw us, he saw you, and he saw you, and he saw me in Christ, in the body of Christ, when? Before the foundation of the world. Now, that was before Adam was created. So God had a purpose way back in eternity that meant that somehow a mem members of the human race that was not even yet begun, God in his purpose was going to take them and pluck them out by his grace and by his own sacrifice of his son and make them a people for a heavenly purpose. Isn't that wonderful? That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. And, and God had this purpose in his heart from way back in eternity. The purpose was required because of the rebellion of Lucifer, as is told us in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, how he desired to have God's job. And he said, I will have said, I will exalt my throne above all the rest of the angels. I will be like God. And God said, no, you won't. You'll go down to the pit. That's where you'll finish up. But Isaiah chapter 46 tells us something very wonderful. And I'll just read to you a little bit of that, Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 11, where God is speaking to his people. And this is by way of bringing things to their remembrance about himself. And this is a little bit of truth about God, what he's like. God says, remember the form of things of old, for I am God and there's none else. You get that? Nobody else. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Only God can do that. That's called the foreknowledge of God. Romans 8 tells us all about that. The foreknowledge of God. My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I can call a ravenous bird from the east. <coughs> I can call a man that executes my counsel from a far country. Yes, I have spoken it. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. Does that sound like somebody who's in charge? It does to me. That's the sovereignty of God. That's when God says, I do things my way and my way will stand. And before Lucifer ever rebelled against God, God knew that he was going to do that. He knew. He understood that. Didn't catch him. God didn't have, God never has emergency meetings. Never has. Oh, look, we better get together. Something's gone wrong and we better sort. No. I know the end from the beginning. And, and, and I thank God that that's the God we can have confidence in today. He knows, the, he knows your end from the beginning too because of the fact that you've put your faith and your trust in him. He knows your end and your end is to be with him in eternity. And the purpose of God, God's purpose in the cross, excuse me, was to be that there will be in eternity, a group of people called the church, the body of Christ, that God is calling out by his grace out of the world today even, still to be part of a body for an eternal purpose in the heavens. The Apostle Paul tells us very clearly in uh, Philippians, he says, our citizenship is in heaven, it's not here. And once we come to Christ, we're only here on a working holiday. All right? And the things that are happening in this world, you can see them as an observer. 
but don't get involved in them and don't get distressed by them because my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God's in control, hallelujah. He's never been out of control and he's still in control. And when we yield our lives to him, we're safe in the arms of Jesus, hallelujah. There's no safer place to be. And God is working out his will and his purpose and, and the effects of Calvary of that moment when Jesus said it is finished he'd finished the work that his father gave him to do and the the results of that are flowing on even today when we're seeing people still come to God by grace isn't it wonderful God's got a way of getting through to people he used to call the the Holy Spirit the hound of heaven because he just chases after people chases after. that's why we pray for our loved ones we never give up praying for them because the Holy Spirit is always after them, always after them. And so God's purpose is going on in the... It's amazing how the gospel gets to people that the devil tries to stop it from getting to them. You've got people in Iran, for goodness sake, where Christianity is, you're a Christian, you've had it. And what, what's happening? The Lord is appearing to people in their dreams, for goodness sake. And families are waking up and saying, I had a dream last night about Jesus, the Messiah. Funny, so did I. I had the same dream. And, and that people are coming to Christ by the thousands because God says, you can do what you like, but I'll still get the people. And God's got his way of doing it. Such is the grace of God. The, the, the results of Calvary flow on today in ways that we can't even imagine or understand. And God is also using you and using me when we talk to people, that we become ministers of the grace of God, ministers of the grace and truth, ministers of the love of God, ministers of the word of God in our witness and the way we conduct ourselves, that the fruits of Calvary flow on through you and through me, such is the will and purpose of God. Isn't it wonderful? Jesus said, it is finished. Hallelujah, he'd done the job. And I'm glad to tell you this morning that there's nothing more that needs to be done. The Apostle Paul reminded us so wonderfully in 1 Corinthians 11 in those verses that our brother talked to us about this morning. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. This wasn't Paul's idea of something that we ought to do, which is a good idea. No, he got it straight from the boss. This do in remembrance of me. For as often you eat this bread and drink this cup, what? You do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So isn't the gospel message that we have a, a great message? Such is the word of God. It encourages us in a world that's going nuts to keep on pressing on for God. Keep putting our trust and our faith in him and he will see us through. The trumpet's going to blow, blow before too long. 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord. This is not some fairy story that's written in the Bible as to tickle our ears. This is fact, and this is how God's working. He's getting the body of Christ in order so that he can call us home. Remember, a great part of the body of Christ is not here anymore. They've moved upstairs. My son is part of them. But I do know this, that I shall see him again, because the Bible says we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Such is our future in the Lord, and it's all because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross of Calvary when he said, it is finished. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you so much for that word, Pastor David. I love hearing about the Passover and, and what he's done on the cross for us and his grace and his love and his mercy. I'm pretty sure that word was just for me. So thank you again, Pastor David and Margaret, for coming and hanging out with us today. We are having coffee afterwards. I'd love to catch up and Gavin's making a coffee. Just for me. Thanks, Gavin. I just wanted to share a quick word around uh, the offering. Uh, 
We've got an FPOS facility up the back. There's also a offering basket and giving details up on the screen. I just wanted to share a quick scripture out of Deuteronomy 8, verses 18. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And then I wanted to finish with 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generous, generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. He's given us the power to get wealth, but he's given that to us so that we've got the ability to give to others. So as we give this morning and as we go this morning, uh, let's just remember to, to go in God. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to give to the kingdom of God this morning. I thank you that you bless our seed. I thank you that you've provided all of our needs according to your riches in glory. Amen. So just a few announcements. Uh, next week, we get to hear an update on the subdivision of the land from Pastor Mark and Cindy. I can't wait for that one. And it's so good to see so many new faces. Remember, if you haven't scanned the QR code, give that a go, because we'd love to catch up with you guys throughout the week. Uh, if you don't know anyone well enough to have a coffee, come and see me. I'll have a coffee. I love coffee. It's my favorite thing. And let's go. Let's have a great morning. Catch up with someone. Enjoy coffee. And have a great week. Amen, guys.